I'm a University of Minnesota Extension Forester, officed in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm going to talk today about jumping worms, a relatively new invasive species in Olmsted County, Minnesota. During today's presentation, I'm going to introduce, do an introduction about invasive species, laws and regulations, how to report in Great Lakes Early Detection Network app, EdMaps online, plus use iNaturalist. Then I'll talk specifically about jumping worms, identification and impacts, next steps, how to help, and policies and research updates. So quickly, let's get started. Invasive species are any species that is introduced, non-native, often moved by humans, and causes ecological, economic problems. So we live in a really mobile society, and that society today enables invasive species to move around very quickly, much more quickly than they would have been able to do it historically. So the meaning of invasive species, I think the definition really matters here. So things can be non-native. Apples and honeybees are non-natives, but deeply treasured in the state of Minnesota. Buckthorn and emerald ash borer are both non-natives and cause both economic, ecological, and human health harms, and therefore are clearly invasive. And then there are native species like poison ivy and bronze birch borer, which we don't like, but they're native, so they can never be invasive. Then, I just want to mention weeds. So weeds are any plant that is growing somewhere you don't want it to grow. So by definition, all invasive plants are weeds, but not all weeds are invasive plants. For example, a milkweed in the middle of a soybean field is considered a weed, whereas a milkweed in the middle of a pollinator planting is considered a value, valuable component of that ecosystem. So let's take a moment to think about stages of invasion. So anything that is new or not present is an early stage invasion. An example of that in Minnesota would be Tree of Heaven. Things that are emerging, so are present but not widely distributed, an example of that would be Oriental Bittersweet. It's known and very problematic in only a few communities in Minnesota, and the rest it's considered not there at all. And then we have established and widely distributed. A good example of that for us is, is Buckthorn. And the reason we think about the stages of invasion is because those stages impact our management options. Uh, the, er, the new and not present species we want to really get to quickly. Those are considered early detection and rapid response species. The emerging ones can be considered early detection and rapid response, depending upon, upon their total density in a given area or across the state. And then those that are established, we have the fewest management options, yet they still require continuing man continuous management. So this is a graph that is kind of generic for any invasive pest, but you'll notice that on the bottom here is when a species is relatively new. You have the most management options, yet it is often the hardest because people aren't familiar with it. Then as a species moves up this chart, People might become more familiar with it. There's more in the landscape. It's typically not until right about here that we start seeing it as a problem. Here is when the media and the general public starts to notice it. But you have a lot fewer management options. The higher you become up this scale, the more species, the more individuals you have in a landscape, that type of thing. So I think jumping worms are right about here on this invasive species curve. In some communities, they're becoming quite a bit more known, they're definitely spreading, but certainly at a statewide level, they're not, we don't think they're endemic everywhere, they've been introduced everywhere. And so we still have quite a bit of management opportunities in some areas. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about precipitation changes in Minnesota. So you'll notice that these maps are all historical data starting in 1891 and ending in 2010. And what you'll really notice is a trend that Minnesota is becoming wetter. So as we get wetter, things that used to be limited by by precipitation in Minnesota really aren't as limited in the same way. And so as we become wetter, more things can survive and more species that weren't invasive uh, can become invasive. Similarly, here's a plant hardiness zone map of Minnesota from 1990 to 2006. So again, all historical data. And importantly, you'll notice that zone three in 1990 was the northern half of Minnesota. I like this example, emerald ash borer has never been found the world over in zone three. But as zone three creeps north, you see the data from 2006, um, that means that emerald ash borer and many other invasive species that couldn't survive in central Minnesota now can survive in that area because it is simply warmer. And if you'll notice that previously Minnesota had no zone five at all, now about the southern third of Minnesota is zone five. 
I would also point out that this data is old. It's over 13 years old now. Uh, I think you would, if you had an updated map, it would be even, you'd see even drastic changes in our temperature. When you couple the precipitation map with the plant hardiness zone map, what you see is Minnesota is becoming an ecosystem that can be beneficial for many species, even species we don't want. So species, again, that used to be limited by cold or wet in Minnesota may not be limited by cold or wet anymore. And those that used to behave nicely in your yards and gardens, uh, they didn't go very far because it was kind of a rough environment. They might be able to escape into our natural ecosystem in a way they couldn't have 50 years ago. So I think it's really important to consider these changes as we think about invasive species. I also think it's real important to realize that as we are shifting our climate, the native ecosystems are becoming stressed. An oak tree that germinated in southwestern Minnesota in a slightly drier and cooler environment finds itself 100 years later in a space that is wetter and warmer than might be ideal for that species. If you project that over an ecosystem, the ecosystem as a total is becoming stressed, niches are becoming open, invasive species are moving into those niches. So in order to manage this problem, Minnesota has enacted uh, quite a number of regulations to try to manage and reduce the impacts of invasive species. We're not going to talk about all of these. A couple of take home points here are that the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the DNR are both imp important players in the regulations in Minnesota. Jumping worms fall under this unlisted non-native species. It's kind of a funny category that the DNR has. So unlisted non-native species of the DNR are those that are not prohibited, regulated, or unregulated. So it's kind of a kind of a catch-all category. Several steps must occur before an unlisted non-native species may be legally released into a free living state. And so you cannot, the point here is, these species cannot be released into a free living space. So anywhere that they might be able to survive. Worms fall under that category. So it is illegal to knowingly introduce worms into the state of Minnesota. We have no native earthworms at all in the state of Minnesota. So any worms that you find are invasive. Jumping worms are just the newest of these invasive worms. So this is an example of how a species might find itself on a list. This is actually for the noxious weed list, but it's a similar process. So first, a species has to become problematic or be perceived to be problematic enough to warrant attention. And so sometimes that's citizens reporting species, we start to notice them, we realize there's more than we expected, they're becoming and showing problematic, uh, problematic indicators in the environment. In other times, it's that other states have noticed it's a problem. We think we have an environment that is suitable to that species, and so we worry about it because we've seen it be problematic in other states. Either one can do it, but something has to cause it to get the attention of decision makers. At that point, there's a fairly rigorous academic assessment done, so they go back and they look at the research. Is it likely to survive here? Is it likely to thrive? Is it likely to cause problems? Are there economic benefits that come from the species? Are those benefits weighed against the economic negative impact of those? species and then if it's decided that the plant or the species is problematic enough to become listed then you have to pick out in which regulation it will become listed so for noxious weeds it goes to one of four categories so we'll look a little bit more closely at the noxious weeds because I think it relates nicely to this whole conversation so uh, Minnesota has a noxious weed law I think it's relatively aggressive uh, fundamentally the more the higher it is on the list, the more management it requires, and the lower it is on the list, the less management required. You can see the statute is down here. And so here, let's have a quick look. So things on the eradicated list, an example would be oriental bittersweet. It is illegal in the state of Minnesota to have oriental bittersweet, and if you have it, you must kill it. Control. So this is common barberry is a good example. So these are things that if you have them on your property, you cannot let them expand in their area. So you can have a small cluster, you're not required to kill that cluster, but you have to take precautions to prevent its spread, both spread to, through seeds, vegetative growth, or any other way that cluster might get bigger. So you have to control it to the size it exists today. Restricted noxious weeds, so buckthorn is a good example of this. These are species that the cat is a bit out of the bag. We know that we don't have any great management, but you're not allowed to knowingly sell them, move them, transport, and, or transport any propagating parts. And then we have specially regulated. This is a bit of a catch-all category. So amber maple is a species in that category. So it is still 
available be sold in the state of Minnesota, but it must be planted at least 100 feet away from any place in which the seeds might germinate. So that is this specially regulated plants is typically a political compromise between a species that is valuable and a species um, and, and the economic harm. So, you know, there are also several different places um, that that also think about invasive species. So the federal government has a whole invasive species program. They think critically about invasive species. And the state counties, um, both there's a, both a federal noxious weed and a county noxious weed list. So there are people at different levels thinking about these. The county lists are sometimes the most appropriate to local landowners. Okay, a different type of regulatory action is considered a quarantine. So most of our insects and our diseases fall under these invasive pest quarantines managed by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So we have four on currently in the state of Minnesota. We have emerald ash borer, gypsy moth, thousand decay cankers disease on walnut, and mountain pine beetle. So the purpose of a quarantine is to reduce or eliminate the spread of a pest through human assisted movement. movement. Restriction um, for pest movements while also facilitating trade. So the idea is this balance between m making money and, and causing economic and ecological and human health issues and trying to mitigate that risk. So there are two types of quarantines in the state. Uh, this map on the left is dated, but hopefully you get the idea. So any county that's in these green areas, that's considered an internal quarantine. So emerald ash borer, gypsy moth, things like that cannot leave those counties without having to go through regulatory action because the counties are quarantined. So the fundamental idea here is there's something in those counties. We don't want that something to move. And so we're going to limit the amount of movement out of that county to prevent the spread of that species. Con conversely, you have what's called an external quarantine. An external quarantine is we don't think we have it in Minnesota, we don't want it in Minnesota. So an example of an external quarantine would be thousand cankers disease on walnut and mountain pine beetle. We know those pests exist elsewhere in the United States, we do not want them in the state of Minnesota, so there are, are rules and regulations that apply to anyone trying to bring materials that might harbor those pests into the state of Minnesota. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about reporting methods in Minnesota. I'm delighted to say that we now report all invasive species across the state, regardless of landscape, so aquatic or terrestrial or worms, which of course are in between, to the same three primary sources. And these are in order of priority. So we would prefer that everyone report invasive species through the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app, which is a free app, Glennon, available on your smartphone on either Android or Apple devices. The EdMaps Midwest website is another platform that you can digitally report invasive species. Both Glennon and EdMaps actually sync to the same online cloud-based database that then generates a verification email to a variety of specified verifiers across the state. Then the third choice is arrest the pest at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. There's both an email and a, a phone number. We would prefer reports come in through options number one, Glennon app, or options number two, EdMaps Online. So now I'm going to show this brief video. It's about a minute long uh, about the way in which you can use the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app from your smartphone. And it, this video is specifically kind of about an emerald ash borer, but again, all invasive species, including jumping worms, are reported through the same platform.
So again, that is the primary way we would like everyone to inv report invasive species in Minnesota. So the EdMaps online platform goes to the same place as Glennon app reports do. This can just be done from your desktop computer. So two easy places in which to do that are report sightings, and the, that'll drop you into a, a menu and you report your sightings. And then there's also some really great information in the tools and training section that can allow you to query for invasive species near you. And then this is another really great app that I want to introduce to you if you're not familiar with it. What we find is that some people aren't very confident in their invasive species identification, particularly for these new and emerging invasive species. And so they're a little hesitant to report because they're worried they have the identification incorrect. So iNaturalist is a wonderful tablet or tool that you can use on any smartphone or tablet to, to just help you with identification for any taxa of species that's, that's alive, um, iNaturalist can help you identify it. And it uses a combination of artificial intelligence with its suggesting feature and then crowd-based responses with its social media platform. And so if you find a species that you're worried about but you're not positive of the identification, you can iNat it, you can get a better identification, maybe learn a little bit about some native lookalikes, and then if you think it really is that invasive species, please then report it to Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. So here's another short video uh, about how to use iNaturalist. Okay, so you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit What did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation detail screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. Excellent. So this is a, just a great tool we found really helps people to better understand in their environment and thus be able to figure out when a species is new and invasive. And so finally, this will be the last video in this short segment. Uh, so this is a one minute video on proper photo identification because if in all of these different reporting mechanisms, photos can be critically important for verification. And so the clearer your photo, the more likely a speedy and timely verification will come through and we'll have better information. All right, so again, the better quality images, the more likely we will be able to quickly identify your invasive species. So switching gears to worms, finally, 
So worms are de decomposers, and as I said before, there are no native earthworms in the state of Minnesota. So it turns out these decomposers become really significant ecosystem disruptors. And so what happens is earthworms impact those primary layers of vegetation on our forest floor. That impacts the herbivores, which impacts the carnivores, which then impacts the top carnivores. And so we see a cascading level of impact. So I'm going to show only um, a little bit of this video, and uh, this really talks about the impacts of earthworms and other invasive species on our, some of our ecosystems. This video was interestingly paid for by the Minnesota soybean growers and is actually about, the whole video is about the interaction between soybean aphid and buckthorn. Let's take a look at who else finds a home on buckthorn. Oat crown rust is a fungi a pathogen that thrives in oats and barley, reducing crop yields by as much as 40%. When it's not on oats or barley, this pathogen lives on buckthorn, causing small brown leaf spots that aren't problematic to buckthorn. Buckthorn grows abundantly in the upper Midwest. It's everywhere. How did this tree that offers safe harbor for the soybean aphid and oak crown rust become so prominent? It had a little help from other species new to North America. These other new species came with the first European settlers way back in the 1600s on plants and in the soil. In the soil from Europe, there were earthworms. Earthworms are not native to most of Minnesota. They are not good for native forest as they gobble up the leaves on the forest floor, disrupting an ecosystem that coexists with the native plants, disrupting things like microbes, fungi, insects, plants, and wildlife. The European earthworm and its predator, the Asian flatworm, digest the plant matter and turn it into soil. This warm digested soil is inviting for new species of plants to move in. Buckthorn seeds like bare mineral soil, compounding the problem. People first brought buckthorn to North America in the mid-1800s and sold it as an ornamental landscaping plant. Buckthorn was planted in yards, in towns, and on farms. People planted it because it made a great hedgerow. If we only knew then what we know now. But there's one more non-native player in this story. In honor of the birds from Shakespeare's writing, a group of Shakespeare fans brought over European starlings from across the Atlantic, had a ceremony, and let them loose in Central Park. That was 1890. These birds took to their new landscape and, along with other species, helped spread buckthorn seeds. Seeds of buckthorn may look inviting to wildlife, but are not nutritious. The birds drop seeds on the soil that was made friendly for invasives by the advanced team of earthworms living and multiplying below our feet. Buckthorn gained a foothold, invading the landscape and the soybean aphid moved in. So I just want to give you a little overview from that Tangled Ecosystem video about really the impact that earthworms have as it relates to many other invasive species. And we ended up with this really complex Tangled Ecosystem. And so, um, jumping worms are just one more addition that sort of complicate matters further and I think frankly have really brought worms to the to the forefront of gardeners mind. Um, previously Minnesota worms were mostly an issue for foresters and forest managers. Jumping worms make them an issue for many gardeners. So here's another schematic of jumping worms, well worms specifically, and so if you recall the definition of invasive, it had to impact human health, economic or ecological impacts, and they had to be negative. So you can see that worms change the soil, this then impacts things like ragweed concentration, which then increases allergy issues. They can also change the soil composition, which changes the herbaceous layer, which has influences and impacts on ticks, which can carry Lyme disease, buckthorn, of course, soybean aphid, Asian lady beetles. You see this whole thing. You also have drought and fire down here, um, nutrient decomposition that in impacts forest biodiversity, forest productivity, and crop productivity. So worms it turn out to be really significant impacts on our economy, our health, and our environment.
And so these are another couple of pictures. So here on the left, we have a healthy soil profile. So this is a non-invaded. And you see a nice herbaceous layer. You can see a really rich topsoil. This is actually light and fluffy when you step on it, um, and a diverse soil horizon. Then you get the invasion of earthworms. This shifts, and so you lose a lot of that herbaceous layer, and you get this really compacted, heavily invaded soil. And these leaves do not tend to last in the environment. They decompose very quickly when they get eaten by worms. The impacts of earthworm also extend to native vegetation loss, hard to regenerate some native trees, habitat loss for ground nesting birds, insects, amphibians, reptiles, and small mammals. So again, this cascading impact becomes really, really important. So jumping worms. So this map was pulled uh, in October of 2019, the known distribution of jumping worms. And it's presented here um, by the county level because not everyone wants their homes identified if they have reported worms and it's been verified. But what you see is we're starting to, to see more infestations. And I'll say this map has changed quite significantly from a year ago. So it, it is these worms are on the move. So here's another way to look at this. Jumping worm impacts drastically change soils. They look a lot like coffee grounds. You can see this represented in this picture. Uh, they do kill plants, and it can increase soil erosion and make it hard to grow other plants. So that's what gardeners are really starting to experience. So here's some identification characteristics. So jumping worm, or the worm on your left, um, they tend to be a little sturdier. They're actually a lighter color on the bottom and darker on top, a little bit more like worms in my experience. But this collar-like structure is the most uh, obvious difference. So this is a night crawler. It's one of our more common Eurasian deep, deep earthworms. Uh, and this collar-like structure on jumping worms, it tends to be this creamy color. It tends to be flat to the worm. Whereas night crawlers, that same collar-like structure, it tends to be a little bit further down the worm uh, and, and it is also raised it's called they often describe it like a saddle uh, like a horse saddle in that it only goes over the top two-thirds of the worm and then on the bottom it's nice and flush and flat so that's typically the the most identifying characteristic uh, we're gonna see a, a picture here in a moment of a video that also is quite dramatic so one of the other key indicators of jumping worms as their name implies is they're very active so these worms really do wiggle around a lot, and that movement can be very noticeable to gardeners. Uh, and so if you see that movement, then you should look closer and, and try to identify it and report it. Uh, that movement also persists when the worms are very young. These are all mature adult worms, but that same movement is present in smaller worms when they're much harder ident to identify in other, other ways. All right, let's talk a little bit about the jumping worm annual life cycle. So it is different than most of our other worms in that they are annual. So the they only persist in the landscape um, for one year, and they overwinter as eggs. So here, this is the fall. Um, right now, these adults are mature. Actually, it's now late October, mid-October. They're starting to die off. They're getting pretty lethargic. Uh, they're laying eggs. Those eggs can persist in leaf layer. We're a little worried about egg cocoons moving around as we rake up our fall leaves those eggs over winter um, in these little cocoons and then in the spring those cocoons are what hatch into small baby worms and then those worms grow and come July and August people start to find a lot of these mature jumping worms and the, the process repeats but importantly jumping worms unlike most of our worms are not present overwintering as adult they're going to overwinter as these egg cocoons so let's talk a little bit about invasive species pathways. So there's natural disruption. So here's some examples of that. So we have birds that fly around. They poop out stuff. Stuff grows. We have um, insects that fly around. We have some things. These are actually gypsy moth larvae that were blown across Lake Superior. Uh, then we have things like dandelion seeds, so seeds that are airborne. They, they get introduced to a site. And then the next next year or later that season, you might have a whole big flush of that same invasive species. So there's lots of ways that invasive species move around, but there are some that we help to assist, and it's those that we have the most control over. So I want you to just take a few seconds to think about the ways in which we as humans can move around invasive species. Okay.
So hopefully you came up with a couple of these pathways. So we know that seeds and potentially cocoons can move around on dirt and mud. And so one way to easily manage this is try to clean off your gear before you move locations. We know that invasive species can move around on equipment. So anytime you have someone coming and working on your property, your yard, you want to make sure that their equipment is clean when they arrive and you want to help remind them to clean it before they leave. We don't need to move these things around. Anytime you have people or equipment or animals on trails, trails need to be monitored pretty closely. Uh, they're just a really good in introduction point. And anytime you have materials brought to your site, whether that's mulch, whether that's sod, soil, plants, compost, any types of materials brought in, there's an opportunity for an introduction of an invasive species. And I would say we worry about worms in pretty much all of these. So um, this, is, this is generic for invasive species, but worms can move in a lot of these platforms. And then finally, we have human error. So I won't go into the long story about this, but this is the Better Homes and Gardens edition from October many years ago. And I don't know if you're familiar with this plant on the cover. Yeah, that's Oriental Bittersweet. So this is one of those examples where inside the author of the piece was talking about crafting with American Bittersweet. The author was very clear that Oriental Bittersweet is an invasive plant. It's, a, it's illegal in 22 states, and to be sure, you craft only with American Bittersweet. Yet every picture in the magazine was of Oriental Bittersweet. So it's an example of where the author got it right, the photographer didn't get the memo, and the editor missed it. That's human error. We can, it happens, we have to sort of manage that, and what we want to do is try not to repeat it. And I feel like that's where Better Homes and Gardens failed. So we brought this up to Better Homes and Gardens, they chose not to write any kind of rescinding comment, and then insult to injury, in my opinion, they then proceeded to run those same Oriental Bittersweet pictures for the next two Octobers, um, next two years in October, and uh, they have run some other Oriental Bittersweet pictures that I think are a different photo shoot, but yet the same place. Plant. So all of those subsequent things could have been managed better and weren't. So that's where I feel like we all have an opportunity to really do better in the future. Okay, so what are some likely jumping worm pathways, really specifically? And so I'll, I'll admit this is my house, um, and I think there's a jumping worm pathway right there. Historically, my house, we've would put down mulch and wood chips um, for water retention, a type of fertilizer for weed prevention, all kinds of great reasons we have done this. We have gotten it both from the local mulch location here in Olmsted County. I've also purchased from big box stores. All of these are potential introduction sources for jumping worms. Um, interestingly, they can survive on cellulose, on wood chips. That's very abnormal in the worm world. But alas, jumping worms can survive in mulch. So it's a possibility. Maybe you can see, maybe you can't. Um, the, tall, the, the tall plants in that pot were started from seed, but there's a layer of smaller annual flowers that I purchased at a local plant sale. I could have brought in worms in my planting potting soil. I don't know if you caught it, but there on the back we have fishing gear. So my kids like to fish and anglers typically use worms in order to do that. And so it is illegal to, to dispose of those worms into the natural ecosystem, either on the lake or at the landing, the boat landing. Um, the proper worm disposal is directly into your trash, but it happens. And so we need to sort of remember that and really advocate to our anglers that they um, always put their worms in the trash when they're done with them. Now moving on to my backyard, maybe you can spot this tomato I have in my landscape. Um, this was also planted at a local plant sale. I, for We were on a family trip this year, so I didn't end up starting anything inside with seed. So all of these things were planted either directly into my vegetable garden or they were purchased at plant sales. Finally, my compost. Um, I do have this compost bin. As you can see, it's heavily shaded. I suspect it does not get to proper composting temperatures. The good news from a jumping worm introduction perspective is it's unlikely that I'm moving any materials very far in my poorly treated compost because frankly I'm producing it and then I'm moving it to you know to my garden so it's all kind of in-house if you will uh, I think lots of people struggle trying to manage their compost and get it to proper composting temperatures um, and that incorrectly composted material can be a potential harbor for and pathway for jumping worms so let's look. So Rochester is blessed to have Olmsted County Waste to Energy Site. Um, that is a waste yard waste site. It is not a composting site. Those are different and they're regulated differently by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. 
Unfortunately, Omsa County Waste Energy did have one of the first confirmed reports of jumping worm in the county last year. And so they put up these signs. They've been working really closely with professionals to try to, to do the best with their compost that they're not spreading weed seeds and jumping worm eggs uh, or adult worms. But the truth of the matter is we're not positive. So it's a challenge. And I said, yard waste is different than compost. Um, and the really big difference is how they're, they're monitored. So jumping worms die at between 120 and 130 degrees. So if compost gets to 131, it should be safe and free from jumping worms. Proper composting temperatures are 150. So that's, if you get to 150, you should have killed jumping worms and you should have killed any weed seeds. Uh, the trouble is that the Minnesota De Pollution Control Agency only regulates designated composting sites to that 150. And so wa yard waste sites aren't regulated in the same way, so it's a little bit riskier. All right, so now if you have jumping worms, what can you do about them? And first, please don't panic, okay? So I, I have them at my house. I understand that they're a gigantic pain. No one wants them. I kind of view them as Japanese beetles. I don't want Japanese beetles. I have Japanese beetles. I have to live with Japanese beetles. It's a drag, but I still have plants. I still have a garden. I still have a landscape. So I do take precautions to avoid spreading them. So I manage my winter or my fall leaves a little differently. I am not putting in mulch and compost the same way as I used to. I'm trying not to move them around my yard. Now they are mobile, but they're worms. They don't move super fast. So just because I originally found them in the front yard, or I'm sorry, in the backyard, doesn't mean that they were in the front yard. Um, and so I can try to prevent that spread across my landscape. Remove and destroy any jumping worms you find. Uh, you could do that with all worms, because remember, none of them are native. So every time I find a jumping worm in my landscape, I put it into a cup, um, I make sure it doesn't squiggle out, and then I put that in my trash bin. I can either put it in my in the cup and throw the whole cup away, or I can put it in a small Ziploc baggie and throw the baggie away. Um, but the idea is that you're disposing of those worms through your trash system. Um, I am experimenting more with what is working in my landscape and what isn't working. Uh, are certain plants getting impacted more than others? Are there some that are doing really well? I'm, I'm thinking about mulch and compost a little bit differently and my fall leaf management a little bit differently. So I'm trying to think about all of these things a little bit more proactively and I'm trying to share what I learn because as with all really new invasive species, we, we don't know a bunch very much about them and how they're going to behave in Minnesota. So it becomes really important to talk amongst ourselves and learn as we go. Spread the word. I find uh, almost no one intentionally wants to be that person who brought in an invasive species. The problem is that people don't know, and so then they do things that then move around invasive species, including jumping worms, uh, inadvertently. And so the more we can help people to not do that, the better off we're going to be. And finally, follow the research. Again, as with all early detection invasive species, uh, there's a lot we still don't know and there's a lot of research happening. So we have to follow that so we can sort of stay on top of new approaches and new thoughts. So things to share with everyone. Don't buy jumping worms. It turns out when you buy things like vermiculture worms or even angling worms, the worms are not necessarily identified properly even when you purchase them. And so it's possible to buy worms. Please don't do that. Don't buy, don't move in space invasive species, including worms. So if you have, if you think you have jumping worms on your property, don't take your potted plant with soil on it uh, to a, a plant sale. That's super not helpful. So um, you want to try to restrict the movement of all invasive species. Anglers dispose of unwanted bait worms in the trash. That is proper disposal of worms. Gardeners be on the lookout for jumping worms in soil, potted landscape plants, mulch, and compost. And finally, vermiculturists. We know that jumping worms have been inappropriately shipped in with vermicultures, which are typically red wigglers. So please try to identify your worms and ensure that you got what you expected to get. All right, there's a place for volunteers and citizen science in this mix too. So actively look for and identify worms. I've told you how to report them. So report them through Great Lakes Early Detection Network app or EdMaps online. Because the more we know about them, the more we know about their density and distribution, the more likely people and decision makers are gonna care and the more likely we might have rigorous, more rigorous uh, regulations around them. Report those jumping worms. 
Um, for our more information, you can always visit the Great Lakes Worm Watch. They have really great information. But one thing to think about is how you can find jumping worms. And so there's this great sampling method that you can use. Uh, it's You mix mustard powder and water together and then you pour it over a foot by foot area of soil and the worms will emerge. So here at the bottom you can see I did this in my yard, three spots in the backyard, one spot in the front yard, and then very quickly jumping worms would come to this hop. Jumping worms only reside in the top eight inches of soil, most prominently in the top four inches of soil. Um, so other worms that are again non-native to Minnesota but can can reside all the way down to six feet of soil. So these jumping worms really hang out at the top. That's part of why they're so impactful for gardeners. It makes them pretty easy to find in this method though. They'll wiggle to the surface within a minute or two. Another really interesting tidbit is, um, we're not entirely sure why, but some research out of Madison, Wisconsin has helped us understand that in most, in many of our worm invaded forests, there are worms in that whole six foot soil horizon, a different species and whatnot of Eurasian worms, but they're worms from zero to six feet in the soil horizon. And for reasons that aren't really clear, when jumping worms move into a forested stand, all other worms appear to disappear. So we go from a whole bunch of worms, different species to only one jumping worm. And then the density of total worms can almost double, so twice as many jumping worms as all other worms combined. We're not really sure about that, but it's super interesting. All right. All right, so research. I already talked a little bit about that Madison research. So Madison, Wisconsin ended up getting jumping worms in its compost distribution system, and it got distributed throughout the entire city. So they're one of the most rigorous research institutes in the upper Midwest doing jumping worm research. But also please know that the University of Minnesota put in a proposal recently to do some jumping worm management and finger crossed that it's been funded. Uh, looks pretty promising at this point. So both of these research projects are trying to figure out if there can be a management for jumping worm because that would really make the world a better place. Also, please know that the Minnesota Invasive Species Advisory Council has been working and was able to finally get someone to own jumping worms as a regulatory species. So that's now Department of Natural Resources. But we're also, MESAC is also working with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to try to figure out if the composting and yard waste site issue can be managed. There's actually several other issues related to invasive species that MPCA has some impact around. So we're, we're trying to sort of organize the world to, to be the most proactive as we can. All right, so I'm sad to report there are no research-based management for jumping worms, including uh, for worms, including jumping worms. We simply don't have any worm management options. So I think it's important to remember though that pesticides are regulated by the US Pollution Control Agency. And then only if something is regulated at PCA at the federal level, does it even make it to the state? And then things must be regulated within the state. So if something hasn't passed both the PCA, I'm sorry, EPA and the MDA, it can't be used as a pesticide, including a wormicide in the state of Minnesota. Fertilizers are regulated at the state level, that's the, the Department of Agriculture, uh, and they're intended to be used as fertilizer, so not as pesticides. All right, final take home message. Uh, so invasive species are a threat and you can help by preventing their introduction, early detection, rapid response, and of course management. So with that, I wanna say thank you for joining me today and for caring about invasive species.